All right, very good. So today we're just gonna have a really, just a very generic overview about refractory hypotension, the choices of vasopressor and inotropes, what and why, and I hope I'm gonna give you some really good pragmatic strategies. Now, the assumption in this talk is, first of all, that most of us really understand about volume. We understand about volume limitation. We understand about some targeted endpoints, but if there are things that I say that don't gel with you or you want more information about them, please feel free, first of all, to chat, and second of all, to always be sure that you let me know if there are topics that you would like to have me speak about in future dates. Remember, we have virtual talks, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. They are not repeats, they are separate talks. And even when I do a subject again, it is always a different talk. I'm gonna start off here with an ashen lethargic patient in the ECC, the emergency care center. Don't assume that he's not hypoperfused because he has a good blood pressure of 120 over 80. If this patient has a history of hypertension, then they could be very significantly hypoperfused. So one of the things that we know and that we really understand today is that having a mean arterial pressure target is a very individualized point that the generic uh, public philosophy is a mean arterial pressure of 65 is going to assure appropriate perfusion. But think about what cost you're achieving that mean arterial pressure. You may be using very aggressive vasopressor therapy. You may be giving a lot of volume and you're using extraordinary efforts to get that blood pressure up. So this patient looks terrible. Oh, Hi, whoever's just joined my friend, please, if you would mute yourself, I would so appreciate it. Thank you. So lots of times people forget that on Zoom, you have to actually mute. So I'm so sorry, but uh, thank you for doing that. All right, so your patient looks terrible for now. And by the way, he's probably gonna get worse. So really important to appreciate that as, you're, as you are evaluating your patient, you're looking at the blood pressure, you're looking at the heart rate, you're looking at central venous pressure, if you have a central venous catheter, there are a couple of caveats that are really important. Every time your CVP is low, as long as you are leveled and you have uh, 300 millimeters of mercury in your pressure bag, if CVP is low, if it goes below zero when the patient is breathing, that patient has hypovolemia. There is no discussion. When CVP is low, <clears throat> patients are always hypovolemic. High CVP, on the other hand, does not mean your patient has too much volume. High CVP traditionally occurs because you have an ischemic arc or you have lost compliance of the right atria and the right ventricle. That could be because of tachycardia. It could be because of positive pressure ventilation. We're never going to use higher CVPs to make decisions about whether or not to give volume, to withhold volume. We're gonna use higher CVPs to help make decisions about right heart support and mo mobilizing volume through the pulmonary bed. But anyone who knows me knows that I don't ever think ever, 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 and I mean ever, that you have a complete picture without targeted endpoints for tissue perfusion. So the most basic level would be from your chemistry profile, which is your anion gap, and your total serum CO2, which is bicarb. That's not partial pressure CO2, it's total CO2, which is a bicarbonate reservoir. If you use bicarb in your institution, Yahoo, and I'm just talking about from your venous sample, your chemistry, not from a blood gas. If you have a wide gap and a low bicarb, typically that will indicate to you one of the big four reasons. Patient has hypoxia and lactic acidosis, patient has acute kidney injury, patient has acute hyperglycemia with ketosis, or the patient may have high chloride, which actually initiates a profoundly acidotic state. So we're going to remember the big four things that we're always going to ask at the bedside when our patient has a base deficit, a wide anion gap, a low bicarb. For the base deficit, you have to have a blood gas. It can be venous or arterial. There's a lot of similarity between the base deficit between the arterial and the venous side. So it doesn't matter. You don't have an A-line, send a venous sample to the blood gas lab. And in this case, it doesn't even have to be central just for the base deficit. So you draw a venous lab and you draw a venous gas and you get basic information that's gonna give you 
tissue perfusion indicators. So <clears throat> today, some of you may know, some of you may be joining today because you heard me on a virtual talk for uh, NTI virtual, which was pre-recorded. And I remind everybody that blood pressure can be very misleading and you always need a platform with tissue perfusion indicators. And there's a lot of them. These aren't the only ones. These are just the simple ones. And I gap low bicarb from a chemistry. I can do a venous gas and get a base deficit. That's going to give me extraordinary information. Now I can get more information with more values. I can get more information by the central line, but I can't ever say that I don't have information for perfusion because I can always use my chemistry to help me understand my patient's perfusion abnormalities. <clears throat> Now, our purpose today is really to talk about, we're really not going to talk much about volume, but, but to talk about vasopressors and inotropes, not inortropes, sorry. I, my fingers did the walk-in and they did it without my brain, which is pretty darn foggy. But I want you to separate your expectations for vasopressors and inotropes. So first and foremost, we always want to remind ourselves that vasoactive drugs in general that would be vasopressors or vasodilators. Those are agents that work on vascular tone. Those are the vasoactive agents. They're either vasopressors or vasodilators. Inotropes are not designed as vasoactive agents. Sometimes when you're using a high dose of an inotrope, you're gonna have some vascular alteration, but you need to separate your expectation vasoactive agents, and in this case today, what we're talking about is vasopressors. Your expectation is that the vascular tone will be enhanced and that the patient's diastolic blood pressure and their mean arterial pressure will elevate. With an inotrope, their blood pressure may respond, but that's not because of the inotrope. The inotrope is enhancing the contractility of your both your right and left ventricle, and that improves the blood volume in the arterial bed. So we have to separate our expectations so that when we're adding agents at the bedside, uh, that uh, we are really, really, really clear about what it is that we want and what it is that we can do. Now, I want to remind you that almost all, not all, but almost all of your vasopressors are basically laboratory manipulation of natural occurring chemicals, catecholamines and hormones <clears throat> that are circulating within your system. So that's really, 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 really important. Um, when we think about that, because the majority of our agents are naturally enhancing agents that impact either alpha, beta, or the direct vascular level. Now, in general, vasopressors and inotropes in general should be run through a central line. Now, a lot of times we don't have a central line. Oh my God, if we don't have a central line, then we have to use what we have but it is really important to appreciate that you may need to give your vasopressor inotrope peripherally or, or intraosseous, but that that is not ideal and that all your focus should be about getting your patient a central line so that you can have more appropriate um, manipulation and administration of their agents. Now, number two, we're gonna look at inadequate fluid loading. That's not really gonna be my focus today. But remember that if CDP is low, if your urine output is in mLs per kg per hour, and you have six to eight hours of less than 0.5 mLs per kg per hour, those are going to be signs of inadequate fluid loading. Now, I want to make sure you understand what I'm saying with fluid loading. I'm not talking about you're loading the patient with fluid. I'm talking about the ventricle is loading the artery with fluid. So a lot of times we give patients fluid and they have extravasation of fluid into the interstitium, their CBP is high, but they're making no urine and their blood pressure is inadequate and the heart is not accepting the fluid that we gave. So really, really important is if at all possible, you want to always have a method 
to monitor ventricular efficiency. And that would be stroke volume whenever possible. So by the way, I don't care what you use. You can use non-invasive clear sight or the Starling, which used to be called the Cheetah. You can use Nikon, you can use the arterial line, you can use a pulmonary arterial line, you can use Pico, Lidco, FlowTrack. You can use ultrasound, you can use continuous TE, don't care. What I do care is that if you are not trying to monitor stroke volume, you're missing 60% of what your goal is. Now, your purpose is to assure that we have an adequate stroke volume and an adequate vascular tone to provide blood flow to maintain tissue perfusion. So it is really important to remember that when you give patients aliquots of fluid, so things like passive leg raise, which is 300 to 500 mLs of fluid from the patient's legs, when you put the legs down, that fluid returns to their leg, or you're giving a fluid challenge of 250 mLs of blood, you're going to expect to see a 10% increase in stroke volume. You don't have an A-line, or you have an A-line, but you don't have a way to measure stroke volume, then you're looking for a 10% increase in continuous systolic pressure. Now you can't do this with automatic blood pressure monitoring, you have to have an A-line. But the other thing is pulse pressure, which is systole minus diastole. Systole minus diastole is called pulse pressure. And it's a poor man's, uh, poor man's representation of stroke volume. So, Again, my purpose today is really not to talk about volume. I love to talk about volume, but today I really want to talk about vasopressors and inotropes, and that's really the focus of the talk. Volume management is critically and profoundly important. We should always try to assure that our patient has adequate volume. There are many ways that we can do that, okay? And then, of course, thinking about your venous sample or your venous blood gas, so chemistry or venous blood gas, and or an arterial blood gas is gonna help you with decision-making. So I gave you volume and your blood pressure got a little bit better, but your acidosis got worse, volume wasn't the answer. That's just the same thing as putting patients on vasopressors and titrating up, the blood pressure might get better, but the tissue perfusion and the acidosis gets worse. This is really concerning and we have to pay a lot of attention when we are at the bedside, looking at our patients and manipulating them. And then the other question, and this is a big one. So we have to feel really confident when we have that discussion with our physician or provider colleagues, is that blood pressure is imperfect, it's single, and it really is not the best measure for patients' volume and circulatory status. So should blood pressure be the main target or should we have a platform? Now, you're going to Obviously, you already know, I think you need a platform. You can look at mean pressure. You can look at systole and diastole. Systolic pressure should go up when you give volume. Systolic pressure uh, should go up when you give an inotrope. Diastolic pressure should go up when you gave a vasopressor. Now, when I say that, don't misunderstand me. If I give you a vasopressor, diastolic pressure is going to go up and systolic pressure is going to go up, but diastolic pressure goes up more because diastolic pressure is an indicator of vascular tone. When I give you an inotrope or I give you volume, systolic pressure is going to go up more if your ventricle accepts that volume and ejects it. So you really have to use your information in a much more critically focused way, and you're going to have to help drive your provider's practice. And then, of course, you need to continuously reevaluate what you've done. My patient's blood pressure dropped, so I gave them fluid. I've gone up on the vasopressors, but what I need to appreciate is if my therapies made the stroke volume go down, so I gave volume and I gave a vasopressor, and I had a stroke volume which was 50, which is subpar, normal stroke volume 60 to 100. Their patient's stroke volume was 50, and when I added a vasopressor, it's now dropped down to 38. I'm headed in the wrong direction. Their blood pressure might look better, but their stroke volume has gotten worse. That's why all, all of our scientific organizations talk about trying to find methodologies to correlate ventricular efficiency, stroke volume, and vascular tone, really diastolic pressure, 
Diastolic pressure profoundly affects mean pressure. That's why we use mean pressure. So I'm gonna remind you, this is about pragmatism. So everything you ever do, you give Lasix, you give insulin, you give volume, you give vasopressor, you give an inotrope, everything you do at the bedside is testing the patient's responsiveness. So when you give a vasopressor, you're looking at the effect on the diastolic pressure and the mean arterial pressure. When you give the patient volume and inotrope, you're looking at the effect on the systolic pressure and stroke volume because you're testing your patient's responsiveness. So we have to always think about the effect of our agents, right? So just basic discussion here. When you're reading about agents or talking about agents or your providers are talking about agents, remember that the goal of the presser is to increase your blood pressure by increasing the resistance and the shunting of blood to your vital organs. Vital organs are those organs which use a lot of oxygen. Inotropes affect your myocardial contractility and they enhance your stroke volume. Chronotropes affect your heart rate and leucotropic agents improve ventricular compliance. So those are things like beta blockers. They improve the compliance of the ventricle and make it easier to fill the ventricle. And dromotropic agents, things like atropine or epinephrine, change conduction speed through the AV junction or stimulate the sinus node to fire more rapidly. So for us today, we're really talking about pressors and inotropes, but we're gonna consider what happens in these other areas with the agents that we are using. So first, foremost, and last, before you hang a vasopressor, be sure that's what your patient needs. Our gut response, our knee-jerk response is always to go for volume and then a vasopressor in any patient who has hypotension. Now, I am not saying that is wrong. Please don't misunderstand me. You cannot allow hypotension to persist for more than one minute. That is an incredible commitment on a nurse's behalf. You cannot allow hypotension to persist. But hypotension is a later sign. So we really have to think about what kind of shock does this patient have and what is our focus? So we might give fluid, we might give a vasopressor, but we are not done because you must actually evaluate what the etiology of the state is and always correlate that back to the evidence of hypoperfusion. Do you have a base deficit? You can see that in your venous sample blood gas, your arterial blood gas, or maybe in your institution, you look at bicarb, so bicarb's gone down. On your chemistry, you're looking at the anion gap, and that's why you have those four things that you ask about. You know what? I'm going to put that in here. Sorry, I didn't, you know, I wasn't thinking very well. Like I said, I'm, I'm pretty sure I also have COVID, so I have a little bit of brain fog, so please forgive me. Uh, I'm just going to type that in here. Your question is always, 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 when you see this, okay, decreased serum CO2 is bicarb, remember, so I'll just say uh, bicarb is low. You have four basic questions, okay, and those questions are uh, AKI, acute kidney injury, which happens with hypoperfusion states, uh, ketosis, so you're looking at that hyperglycemia and wondering if the patient's ketotic, uh, hyperchloremia, and last but not least, lactic acidosis. Now, what's so beautiful, whoop, lactic acidosis. What is so beautiful about this is you can answer most, oh, I, I thought I fixed that, sorry. Okay, so let me go back there, okay? And you can just look at your chemistry profile for the first three. So you're looking at your chemistry profile for the first three, and you're saying, yeah, is creatinine really isn't elevated? Is urine output is okay? Creatinine is a baseline a little bit more than it was when he came in, but not 50% greater. He doesn't have hyperglycemia. He could still have ketosis, but I don't think so. And his chloride is normal. Well, then you think it's lactic acidosis. And of course, you've got to do an extra lab for that. But lactic acidosis can only be diagnosed in the presence of acidosis, not just with an elevated lactate, you've got to be acidotic. 
So those are simple things that you can do at the bedside to look at very basic evidence of hypoperfusion. Now, this is not the end all and be all, but I wanna remind you, hypotension is a late sign. By the time your patient gets hypotensive, you've missed something. And that's what we're trying to do. Now, is your blood pressure, if you're measuring it with an A-line, is it accurate? Should you validate with an oxalate, which is your automatic blood pressure? No, why would you ever do that, right? An A-line is blood flow. An oscillated blood pressure is sound of arterial wall rebounding. So you can't really validate your arterial line blood pressure with your oscillated blood pressure. In general, uh, and I fight this fight. In fact, I had a fight on, uh, not a fight. Let me say it in a nicer way. A very, very significant discussion today on critical care quality meeting to say, why do we ask nurses to measure blood pressure in two ways? If your A-line is damped, if there's a problem with your equipment, stop monitoring that and start monitoring oscillated. But why are you monitoring and charting both? And we all know what that answer is. So your provider can choose the one they like the most. Well, that isn't helpful. That doesn't help your patient. So there are many ways that you can check the accuracy of your arterial flow. The most important one, and again, beyond what we're talking about here, happy to talk about another time, is true, real return to flow. And then of course, a major question is, is the patient's hypotension related to volume? And that of course is our first consideration. We're always going to give you volume first unless we have complete evidence that your ventricle can't mobilize the volume, like in congestive heart failure or cardiogenic shock. You've got volume, but it's in the wrong place. And that's why I say your responsibility, your responsibility, you're the one giving volume. You're the one titrating vasopressors. This is no one else's responsibility. Your question is, when I gave you volume, did your interstitial edema get worse? Or did you actually mobilize that volume into your arterial bed? And guess what that means? Your blood pressure responded and stayed responsive when you gave volume. If you're giving volume and your patient's not responding, they should have a 10% increase in their systolic pressure, a 10% increase in their stroke volume. If you're giving volume and the patient's not responding, and if their base, their wide gap, their bicarb get worse, the volume you gave the patient didn't actually help them. So I feel like we should be asking those questions. Now, we certainly appreciate that in our ICUs, I'm not telling you have a blood pressure revolution, although I'd love that. I'd like to have a nursing revolution actually, but okay, I'm not really organizing that for you because I want you to have your job and to be able to take care of your family and most of all, to be able to save patients' lives. So we understand that in general, we use an absolute MAP of greater than 65, but you know what? That's for everybody. So if you're hypovolemic, if you're hemorrhagic, if you have cardiogenic shock, if you have sepsis, if you have neurogenic shock, you have anaphylaxis, everybody has a mean arterial pressure greater than 65. Okay, no. No, we really have to consider indicators that are specific to our patient's diagnosis. Now, there's a really great predictor that's called the shock index. Feel free to look it up. I'm also happy to send you some articles. It's really used primarily in trauma and hypovolemic shock not necessarily in cardiogenic or septic shock, but it can be very helpful. It's a ratio of heart rate divided by blood pressure. So really, really, really easy. And that's the systole, the mean arterial pressure. Heart rate divided by mean arterial pressure. Any ratio greater than one is a predictor of mortality and morbidity. Now that's in trauma and hypovolemic shock. So that's really a good guide for us to give volume, for us to give red cells, and always to remember that what you have everywhere are the indicators for tissue hypoperfusion. So when we think about ad administering vasopressors and inotropes, it's gonna be very, very important to remember that hypotension results from hypovolemia. You don't have volume, you don't have volume in the vein, you don't have volume in the artery. Or from cardiac failure, pump failure, you have volume, it's in the veins and the interstitium, but not in the arteries. Or from an alteration in the ability to maintain your vascular tone. That's called pathologic maldistribution of blood flow. It's a big mouthful. What it means 
is that you either have lost sympathetic stimulation because you severed your spinal cord, you have a high degree of histamine release, such as an anaphylaxis that causes loss of vascular tone. You have a high degree of inflammatory mediator release that causes vasodilation, that's called sepsis. And the most common one and the least diagnosed is refractory metabolic acidosis. So again, I probably should say underneath this, pathologic maldistribution of blood flow, sepsis, anaphylaxis, so you get me to repeat it and I type it and hopefully sepsy. Hey, I got sepsy. It's a new drink. Okay. I got sepsy back. I'm sure you all saw that. Anaphylaxis, neurogenic. And the big one that you don't think about is metabolic acidosis, which causes loss of vascular tone. Now we're going to use our vasopressors based on current data, right? Is we're going to use our vasopressors when your baseline systolic blood pressure has dropped more than 30 millimeters of mercury or 20% from the standard baseline. Even though vasopressors are really more about the diastolic pressure, this is what all our scientific organizations put forward. And then if your mean arterial pressure is less than 60 or 65, and there is evidence of end organ dysfunction due to hypoperfusion. Remember, you got a base deficit, you got a wide gap, you have a low bicarb. Always consider volume resuscitation first. Be gentle with volume. Give small amounts and test the patient. So you're giving a small amount of volume to test whether the patient responds. It is really important to remember that if you are bleeding, if you are bleeding, you will have hemorrhagic hypovolemia. If you have hemorrhagic hypovolemia, sorry, my little ringer is going off telling me I'm supposed to be doing something else, but I'm not. A hemorrhagic hypovolemia gets much worse when you add vasopressors because now you've enhanced vascular tone that destabilizes clots and it promotes bleeding. So 20 years ago, an ED doc who was also a trauma surgeon, whose name was Ken Maddox, that's M-A-D-D-O-X at uh, uh, Ben Her uh Herman Hospital, Ben Taub Hospital in Houston, Texas, wrote the first publication for traumatic consideration of permissive hypotension. And he was very poo-pooed. People like totally dissed him. They said, oh, he's crazy. And you know what? Today he's venerated. Absolutely really cautious when adding vasopressors to someone who's hemorrhaging because that destabilizes the clot because it creates a much higher pressure uh, border, and that can cause significant problems. Cardiogenic shock can also get much worse when vasopressors are added because that increases significantly the work that the heart must do. <clears throat> now, it kills me to say this, it kills me, because in my hospital, there's always a discussion. The anesthesiologist is bolusing the patient with neosinephrine on the way back to the ICU from the OR. But guess what? It was the right thing for them to do. Phenylephrine, neosinephrine is really good for post-intubation, post-anesthesia, or post-pump transient blood pressure. So what are they doing? Testing the patient. They're giving a bolus of phenylephrine. They could also give a bolus of epinephrine that can be repeated every minute, 10 to 20 mics at a time. But here's the thing. When an anesthesiologist comes in to your ICU and says, I gave three doses of phenylephrine on the trip from the OR, that means you're going to need an ongoing infusion. Not necessarily a phenylephrine. That's not really the drug of choice in general for the kinds of patients we treat in ICU. But it is really important to appreciate because I used to say, oh yeah, they just want to, they didn't want to mix your drip. Oh no, that's not true. It's because phenylephrine is the drug of choice for that transient hypotension. So that's a really good use for push dosing. But once your patient gets to the unit now, you're going to have some decisions about the target map. So recent literature shows that in patients who are 65 years or older, 60 millimeters of mercury map may be equivalent to a map of 65. Now, historically, we've said that higher map goals are not 
necessarily beneficial. Some patients who have coronary artery disease, patients who have a graph, an arterial graph in particular, patients who have strokes, um, not hemorrhagic strokes, because remember the word hemorrhage, I'm going to keep that blood pressure down until you get repaired. But ischemic stroke, I might want to have the MAP goal much higher. But recent data, so I've given you a link right here to an article from 2018. There's a lot of recent data, actually, that is talking about that acute kidney injury is linked to a mean arterial pressure of less than 85. And mortality and AKI risk get much worse at lower thresholds. So it's important to have discussions with your colleagues. Do we want to maintain a higher mean pressure, especially in a person who is septic with organ dysfunction to try to protect the kidney? But again, I want you to remember that just giving patients vasopressors to enhance their vascular tone is not gonna be beneficial if you are not also supporting perfusion. So nice recent article just published in 2022 uh, from very, so some people on here, Tom Sharon, Jan Bakker, um, uh, uh, Van, Van Der Ven. These are people that I'm often serving on panels with or actually being asked to publish with. They are very well respected. They are, this is from the European Society, but it is really important. I love what they said, and I want you to embrace that. Nurses are in charge of monitoring the changes in blood pressure, but the physicians in general are in, are in charge of treating hypotension. And most respondents, both nurses and doctors say, we need to improve hypotension management. Now here in the United States, nurses in general have a very high degree of autonomy. And as you are probably aware, CMS and JCAH really want to put the kibosh on nurses' autonomy. They want nurses to follow hypotensive treatment protocols and not titrate without an order. So currently uh, I'm on a group uh, with Judy Davison, Teresa Rincon, uh, Tom Marins and others. We've been actually working on this since the, uh, this document came out from CMS about nurse restriction in uh, vasopressor titration. And we've created a very big dialogue. We've had five publications. We're also looking for nurses to answer some survey questions. So if you're interested, just reach out to me. I'll, I'll put you in touch with the survey. It takes about five minutes because we are pushing back hard to say, you know what? In Europe, you have like five intensivists in the ICU and the nurses don't titrate like we do in the United States. In the United States, oftentimes we don't have a physician there, we don't have a provider there, and nurses need to have the opportunity to titrate within their knowledge. But here is the real killer. Okay, so what they said is nurses monitor the blood pressure, physicians treat the blood pressure, but look at this, this is a killer. 91% of acute kidney injury that occurred in these hundreds of patients was related to hypotension, 91%, okay? And then myocardial injury and infarct, gastric ischemia, stroke, limb ischemia, and other. And the frequency of that, look at how frequent it was that you saw acute kidney injury with hypotension. Now I'm kind of in love with the kidneys, so I'm not very happy about knowing that I might be able to do something different within the guidelines of my practice and within the acceptability at this moment of what JCH and CMS say. And I wanna make sure that I understand the simple components of perfusion therapy. If you're hypovolemic, you need fluid. And remember hypovolemia is intravenous, interarterial, and interstitial, okay? If you've lost vascular tone, you're gonna to need to have judicious vasopressors and some limitation of fluid because the more fluid I give you, the more you're gonna creep fluid into the interstitium when you've lost vascular tone and it destabilizes the lining of the endothelium. So quite concerning. And then of course, myocardial efficiency. And that means that I'm gonna consider inotropes. So again, there are many ways for us to look at volume status.
Uh, there are ways for us to look at vascular tone. In general, what I'm gonna look at in vascular tone is that if the heart rate is up and the blood pressure is down, particularly the diastolic pressure or the MAP, you're gonna need some vasopressors. You're gonna need that pretty quickly. And I'm gonna be careful about the volume because if I give you too much volume, you're gonna leak volume into the interstitium. But also I'm always going to encourage the evaluation of stroke volume. And if I don't have that capability in any way, shape or form, then I'm gonna use systolic blood pressure. I don't recommend that, but if that's all you got, that's all you got. Now, lots of you have seen this before. I talk a lot about vasopressors and ionotropes. And this is the chart that basically says blood pressure normal to low, stroke volume low to normal, and the correlation thereof. So when your stroke volume is low and your blood pressure is normal, you just need volume and then you might need some inotrope. But your, your blood pressure is normal. You have a significant base deficit. You're hypoperfused. Don't wait for hypotension. Give volume and inotrope. If the blood pressure is low and the stroke volume is low, you're going to need vasopressors and volume and you're also probably going to need an inotrope. Now, when you give that volume, you give the vasopressor, you're going to chart and track that stroke volume, and you're going to add an inotrope if the stroke volume went down when you gave volume and or vasopressor. If your blood pressure is low, but your stroke volume is normal, you need a vasopressor. Your goal is to get that blood pressure up, but to treat the problem, hypovolemia, cardiac, vascular tone. That's really our responsibility. So you've got to treat that underlying physiology by defining the category, hypovolemia, cardiogenic, septic. Choose the right agent. And again, I'm going to remind you, in the last five years with artificial intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence evolution, hypotension predicting software. So if you're using FlowTrack or ClearSight, on your next version of software or equipment, you will actually have a hypotension predictive algorithm. Now you may choose to use it or you may not, but that will actually correlate changes in vascular tone, changes in volume and changes in inotrope and give you a suggestion of what to do for your patient to protect them from hypotension because even brief hypotension increases morbidity and mortality. So we've got to be on top of hypotension. But it's also important to remember that overuse of vasopressors during shock resuscitation can actually worsen outcomes. So again, remember, you only give volume because you want to increase stroke volume. You think it's because you want to increase blood pressure, but it is actually to increase your stroke volume. As you increase your stroke volume, your systolic pressure will go up and your mean pressure will go up. If the fluid you're giving the patient doesn't increase the stroke volume, then fluid loading is probably not the answer for that patient. And again, if you've heard me talk, I use this car or cartoon. It's my cartoon. Uh, it's on the Edwards Life Sciences website. It's everywhere in every talk I do. And that is to remind you that volume given in the vein should always end up in the artery. So what that means is I'm giving you volume, maybe your CVP went up, maybe it came down because your heart rate came down and your stroke volume or your systolic arterial pressure should always go up. End of discussion, really good. Now we move to the vasopressor and we say, okay, so adding a vasopressor and a second vasopressor, I need to have some questions. I have a lot of autonomy. I can titrate and I get an order for it later. My doc trusts me. I doubled what I started with. But by the time you double what you started with or you've added a second vasopressor, you need to step back and say, am I actually treating the cause of shock here? Because if my patient has lost vascular tone, they don't have metabolic acidosis, they should respond to a vasopressor. If they're not responding to a vasopressor, is that what they need? So I need to come back and say, what is the problem? Does the patient need an echo? Can we get an echo? Can we do an ultrasound? Can we look at collapse of the neck vein? You don't have to have something profoundly invasive to just say the patient isn't responding. So most of the time, what I see, maybe not what you do, is you start with norepinephrine, you're at four, then you go to eight, then you go to 12, then you go to 16, now you're at 22, now you're at 30, and you didn't discuss it 
You didn't look at what was happening. You're just titrating up to a target mean arterial pressure that was chosen basically out of the air. And we're not having a discussion about the patient's failure to respond. I want to remind you, if you have metabolic acidosis, not respiratory acidosis, metabolic acidosis, the efficacy of your catecholamine vasopressor. So that would be norepinephrine, dopamine, um, epinephrine. Those are your, and neosinephrine. Acidosis will decrease the efficacy of those vasopressors. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't say to you, if you're getting ready to have CMS or JCH, or they've already been at your hospital and they're coming back, you need to be sure that you're documenting the target with every titration of dosing and that you have an order for titration. Now, let's be real here. Your patient's crashing, you're titrating, but you got to go back and write in the documentation endpoint for titration. And you also have to get your physician to write an order. Most unfortunate because it really limits your autonomy. But if you're not documenting and discussing this in the last 24 hours and you're titrating up, 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 you're going to get dinged and you're not going to be accredited on your first round. So make sure you're documenting your titration and that you have an order. So remember what we talked about with vasoactive agents. First, we want to think about our receptor sites. So I love the fact of the receptor site that's called alpha. Alpha is in the arteries. It's also in the veins, but alpha stimulation really affects vasoconstriction. Beta stimulation, particularly beta one, the most important organ in the body, the heart. So beta one stimulation increases inotrope and chronotrope. So that's, of course, remember the heart rate, right? So very important to remember alpha one, for vascular, and that's vasoconstriction. Both artery and vein will constrict with your alpha agents. So my purpose here is to really talk about alpha one, beta one, and some beta two effects. Not gonna talk about dopamine. Dopamine is self-selected in very particular populations, typically in cardiogenic shock with cardiologists who believe that dopamine gives them better cross coverage, and that is totally okay. But dopamine in general is not the drug of choice for vasoactive drips. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't expand that a little. So if you just take a look at these first three, phenylephrine, remember transitional, or if you are in neurogenic shock, you might be on a neosinephrine drip, that's okay. It's pure alpha-1, 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 all the way, no beta norepinephrine is alpha-1 first and beta-1 second. Epinephrine is alpha-1 first and beta-1 at the same time. So cardiac surgeons tend to like epinephrine because it gives vascular tone plus an increase in inotropy and can also increase the heart rate. So surgeons, cardiac surgeons tend to like epi. Remember, dopamine tends to be a drug of choice for some cardiac intensivists and cardiac populations. And now I'm gonna talk about three other or four other agents. Two with blood pressure issue, okay? Vasopressin, which is not a catecholamine. It is not a sympathetic stimulant. It stimulates vasopressin receptor sites that reside in your vasculature, directly affecting those receptor sites and enhancing response to your catecholamines. That's why you use vasopressin. Enhances response to catecholamines. Corticosteroid actually is what we call an oxyradical scavenger. And so we will often use corticosteroid therapy to suppress the worst vasodilator, the worst vasodilator, that the patient releases himself, which is nitric oxide synthase. So sometimes patients have refractory hypotension because they have incidental pituitary insufficiency or adrenal insufficiency. So that's another reason that patients may not respond to vasopressors and we always have to consider that. So thanks, Mohammed. that's really the basic answer. And really it's only acidosis that I'm talking about here. And, um, and then also that your patients become refractory 
to the agents that you're giving. At about 48 hours, they start to be refractory to the agents you're giving. Dobutamine is used primarily as an inotrope, and that's because it affects beta-1 first, beta-2 second, and only at extraordinarily high doses, you might actually see some enhanced vascular tone. Never use dobutamine to treat blood pressure. Never, 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 never. And you as nurse cannot titrate dobutamine without a direct order. You must have an order. Do not titrate without a direct order. And then we talk about milrinone. Milrinone is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. So again, these, these agents, vasopressin, corticosteroid, and milrinone, they don't fit into the basic criteria. They're agents that we're gonna use for particular purposes. And th those particular purposes are really quite important. So we use norepinephrine as a first line for septic shock. And we also use it if our patient has cardiogenic shock and they're profoundly hypotensive, not hypotiformsin, hypotensive. Epinephrine for anaphylactic shock, cardiac arrest, post-pump. Vasopressin, we're going to use when our patient has refractory uh, hypotension, refractory to volume and catecholamines, we add vasopressin. Some places like to use vasopressin as a primary agent. They start it as a secondary agent, even when you don't have evidence that you need it. Okay, don't sweat the small stuff, who cares? But you need to know what vasopressin does, right? It is an agent that works even in the presence of profound metabolic acidosis. And then again, neosinephrine, remember, is typically because of anesthetic or post-intubation vasoplegia. That's why we use neosinephrine in general. And it also can be used for neurogenic shock patients. And then again, dobutamine, typically used for medically refractory heart failure. Okay, so again, compensated septic shock, that means you have a good cardiac output. You're gonna get norepinephrine, epinephrine, vasopressin. That may be your second line. It could be your third line. Always consider steroids. Always consider angiotensin II. If you're not having discussions about it, you need to. Anaphylaxis, you start with epinephrine, cardiogenic shock. Remember, we're going to use norepinephrine for hypotension, but your second agent will be low dose to titratable dobutamine. Nurses do not titrate dobutamine without a direct order. And in general, following cabbage, we're going to use neosinephrine for transient hypotension and an epinephrine drip. So just reminding ourselves, norepinephrine, powerful, powerful vasoconstrictor, very modest dinotropic effect and very modest chronotropic effect. It's a really important vasoconstrictor. Three to five times more potent than phenylephrine for raising MAP, but you can't bolus patients with it. So that's why your anesthesiologist gives a bolus of neo or a bolus of epi with the assumption that this might be transient hypotension. They get to your unit, you should anticipate that you're going to need a norepinephrine drip. And that's going to be what you're going to do. It's cardiotoxic at high doses. That means it's going to cause very significant cardiac dysfunction by imbalancing oxygen supply and demand. So, epinephrine, lower dose epi, so that's 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 mics per kg per minute, is primarily beta 1. That increases the heart rate. It reduces the length of time we're in systole, and it can significantly increase myocardial contractility and promote a little bit of arterial dilation. One of the problems with low dose epi or high dose epi is that your patient will become hyperglycemic, and hypokalemic. Epinephrine causes insulin resistance. So whenever you're using epi, you need to be on continuous insulin. If you allow patients to have one or two or three hyperglycemias that are not related to eating, you're doing the wrong thing. You need to get on insulin. That's going to be a really important thing, most highly related to epinephrine, but it also occurs with norepinephrine. Higher dose epinephrine, greater than 0 0.1. Now what you've done is you've overwhelmed those beta effects. Now you have profound vasoconstriction. You also have a significant increase in glucose because again, you have insulin resistance. But what's really important here is that higher dose, greater than 0 0.1 mics per kg per minute, higher dose actually significantly impacts renal blood flow and puts your kidneys at risk for acute kidney injury.
So remember, we talked about phenylephrine, alpha, 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 no beta, no beta. It get, its onset is immediate, half-life is five minutes, and it lasts about 15 to 20 minutes. Just enough time to get in the elevator and get to the ICU after the OR or after intubation. It is not recommended for cardiogenic or septic shock because of the alterations that can occur. When we talk about renal mesenteric and coronary arteries, which will become profoundly vasoconstricted. So really, really important to remember, you can see very significant impact. The heart rate goes down, you've got VTAC or VFib, a very poor ventricular efficiency. It is a dangerous drug to give to patients who have mild to moderate cardiac dysfunction. So again, we're always gonna consider that we're gonna use neosinephrine with a cardiac surgical patient, with patients just come off pump, we're gonna use it for patients post intubation, we're gonna use it for patients post anesthesia for a really short time. And we're also gonna remind ourselves that similar to cortisol, this very potent vasodilator, nitric oxide, uh, vasoplegia, in these patients, because they're hyperinflamed, we ran their blood through a pump, you can even see it with CRT, that, that hyperinflammation, because we're running blood through a pump, they may dysregulate their nitric oxide, and so they can have vasoplegia. So again, Mohammed, metabolic acidosis, high production of nitric oxide, and by the way, you're just you're just accepting that. You're not actually evaluating it. You're saying, in this situation, I believe hyperinflammation caused vasoplegia. Neosinephrine might assist my patient. Vasopressin, not adrenergic. It's noradrenergic. It has nothing to do with your sympathetic system. It acts on vasopressor receptors. It does not impact inotrope. It does not impact chronotrope. But as you see vasopressin added, you, you may actually see that because you've had profound vasoconstriction, the heart rate goes down and your stroke volume goes down. So be aware of that because that's a negative effect with vasopressin that you as bedside nurses need to be aware of. You may also see, of course, as you add vasopressin, your patient's urine output goes down and that's concerning because it's impacted the renal blood flow. And so you're now not making your best urine. So in general, in general, you're gonna add vasopressin to norepinephrine. Typically we don't titrate, we start at 0.04 units per minute. Um, or if you wanted to look at it per hour, you, you can actually calculate that. So you're saying 0.04 units per minute. So in an hour, that's 60 times 0.04, that would be 0.24. So when you're giving patients a dose of 0.4 units per hour, you are overdosing your patient on vasopressin. We do not use higher doses unless there is a specific reason and only, only, only with a direct provider order. So not necessarily a doctor, but the provider. So your APPs, your physician must be a provider. Lots of bad things happen with vasopressin that you might not be aware of. Not the least of which is procoagulation and mesenteric ischemia. Okay. So very, very important. Now, the other drug that I think is just important to include here when we're talking about hypotension is angiotensin II. Now, angiotensin II, based on the ATHOS-3 trial and the replications, is used for vasodilated shock while patients are still compensating with a high stroke volume. So they've got to have a high stroke volume and a diagnosis of vasodilating shock, primarily sepsis, for us to consider the administration of angiotensin II. And typically, angiotensin II is your second or third vasopressor. So for most folks, it's norepinephrine, epinephrine, angiotensin, norepinephrine, vasopressin, angiotensin. This is the most potent vasoconstrictor known to man, but your pharmacists control it. It's expensive. And don't bother asking about angiotensin if your patient's stroke volume is poor because it's such a profound vasopressor, 
it will significantly impact cardiac function. So it's, it's actually administered in nanograms. It's a very low dose. We typically give a 10 to 20 nanogram per kilogram per minute initial dose. We titrate up and we do that pretty quickly. Every five minutes, 10 to 15 nanograms per kilogram. Max dose is 80. And you might get to 80 where you break through, you control the pressure, and then you've got to rapidly go down to 40. It takes about five minutes to reach target map. So from my point of view, I, there are lots of issues, not the least of which is the cost, but you know, vasopressin is five to 600 a vial. Angiotensin is 1500 a vial. But if you're on vasopressin and you're not responding, I'm gonna, I want you on angiotensin too, if you have vasoplegia or dilating, uh, dilated septic shock. Very quickly, but the problem of course with this is that it also can stimulate hypercoagulation. And in the ATHOS-3 trial, patients were about 12% more likely to have DVTs than patients who were not on angiotensin. In the ATHOS-3 trial, there was one minor pulmonary embolism and no other pulmonary embolism. So I don't feel that that's a reason not to consider it. Now, if your patient is on a NACE inhibitor or they're on an angiotensin receptor blockers and they've been on them for three years, you're not giving them now because you're trying to get their blood pressure up and those are uh, antihypertensive agents, but they can log around for a little while. So this may make you angiotensin insensitive. I think every bedside provider should be talking about angiotensin when you're talking about hypotension. So here you are with hypotension. Remember, you're gonna activate your sympathetic nervous system because of the baroreceptor, which recognizes that you don't have enough blood volume or enough pressure. That increases your sympathetic activity. You gotta have good sympathetic nervous system stimulation. You have to have an intact spinal cord and that's going to increase cardiac stimulation. Heart rate will go up. Contractility will go up and that should increase your overall cardiac output, which is heart rate times stroke volume. And that should increase your blood pressure. Norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, phenylephrine all promote increased sympathetic activity uptake because they're circulating catecholamines required for the uptake of sympathetic stim and that promotes vasoconstriction. Vasopressin promotes vasoconstriction, but it doesn't require the increased sympathetic stim, which by the way, when you have a patient who is acidotic, you will lose the ability to respond to these sympathetic activity agents, circulating catecholamines, endogenous, exogenous, because they all depend on potassium inside the cell. When patients are acidotic, potassium comes out of the cell and the cell takes up the metabolic acid hydrogen. So we have to move quickly to vasopressin, which promotes vasoconstriction. Angiotensin two actually supports renin angiotensin. Um, uh, and it's not RAS, it's R-A-A-S, sorry, my mistake. Renin angiotensin aldosterone system, not RAS, this is RAS for sedation, sorry, my bad, R-A-A-S renin angiotensin aldosterone system activation, which promotes vasoconstriction and reabsorption of salt and therefore water and thereby increasing the cardiac output. So by the way, two arms of this are about increasing the cardiac output, which you should be paying attention to. And one is actually directly about vasoconstriction. That's really important. Okay. So we are at one minute after five. So I am uh, actually going to end here and I'm going to continue with inotropic support tomorrow on Wonderful Wednesday. And we're going to really focus on dobutamine and milrinone. And we're just going to remind ourselves about our responsibility when we're looking at patients with hypotension. And I want to respond also to this JCAH and CMS issues. Your starting dose must match your provider order. And as you titrate, you must have an order. If you are bolusing, do not use 999. Program your bolus into your pump. That's what JCH and CMS looks at. When you start your, when you start titrating, you must have a provider order. Now, you and I know we can get that retrospectively, but we must have a written order in the chart. Right now, we're working hard. You've got hundreds 
of CNSs and experts around the country who are working hard to get rid of this draconian solution of JCH and CMS. But in order for you to pass your inspection, you must have an order. You must notify when you've changed to a higher rate. No, I'm not calling you if my patient is crashing, I'm going up. I'm gonna call you when I've quadrupled the initial dose to tell you the patient isn't responding. And here's what I did with the first titration, here's the second, here's the third, and here's the fourth. And I need my provider to write an order that covers me. When we're talking about CPOT pain and sedation, same thing, order titration parameter score, document the score, document why you're going up, document your handoff communication, and document when you're using more than one drip to actually treat your patients. So I'm going to stop sharing. I'm gonna tell you thank you, and Christy, thank you so much for joining. I think you're the only one who recognized that ACMPs were gonna be here today. Uh, so I'm happy that you joined. I hope you learned something from this talk. I don't, Drew didn't really organize for today's talk. I don't think so, uh, but that's okay. I think it's really happy that you're here. Uh, Christy is a provider. So it is really important to recognize that our providers are really interested in hearing what we learn about and what we talk about so that we can all work together in a more beneficial way. So I'd love to answer some questions. I also wanna be respectful because it is 5.04, so I'm four minutes past the one hour time, but I'm very happy to answer questions. You can either chat, and you can chat just to me if you don't want others to hear you, or you can unmute yourself and ask a question, and then otherwise I'm going to invite you to come back tomorrow for inotropes. All right, my friends, it seems like there aren't too many questions. Mohammed, I, I hope I answered really the question. Temperature change is not really an issue that causes a, a problems with vascular tone, except trying to release heat. So really, really important to look at the integrity of the vessel and to recognize inflammatory mediation, production of nitric oxide. You suppress that with, uh, you suppress that with vasopressin, you suppress that with cortisol, and by the way, you can also suppress that with methylene blue. So sometimes after cardiac surgery, we'll see that our surgeons will order methylene blue. That can also be really helpful. So again, tomorrow I'll finish this talk if that's okay for everybody, but hopefully you learned a lot about vasopressors today and hopefully you're gonna be able to apply that at the bedside. Thank you guys for the nice comments. I really appreciate it. And I will hope to see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank you again. Bye.